day, and I uh, just want to take a moment to honor some of our veterans in the house today, both uh, active duty and those that have uh, PCS, ETS, however you've done it, retired. Um, if you are a veteran or if you're serving in the military, would you mind standing to your feet for just a moment? served our, uh, our country and served us and given us an opportunity to even meet in this place this morning. Uh, it's, a, it's an awesome honor to be able to worship with you this morning. Father, we just thank you for who you are, God, and for what you've done. You are the ultimate sacrifice for us. You showed us how to do it. God, I thank you for the men and women that stood this morning in this place that represent uh, years and years of people that have sacrificed for our freedoms in this country. God, we just honor you and thank you for giving us such a great country as America, God. And uh, Lord, we choose this morning to honor those folks. Look, the Word of God tells us to give honor to those whom honor is due. So, Father, we do that. And Father, we give you the honor and glory this morning in Jesus' name as well. God, thank you for who you are, for what you've done, and what you're doing in this place. God, we ask that as Pastor Chad comes this morning, you would speak to our hearts, God. Change us. God, I pray that this morning, if if you're speaking to our hearts, that we'd listen. And God, as, as we listen, Father, I pray that you'd help us to respond in a way that we never have before. Change us this morning, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Pastor Matt just throw me for a loop all day today. Usually when you are shaking hands, I get all my stuff and get ready and come over here. And... Thanks, Pastor Matt, so much. We appreciate it. <laughs> a couple key dates here. Eddie, we'll leave here just for a second. This Thursday, our life groups for serve night. We've got a planning and zoning hearing of downtown. Uh, as many of you know, we're not building a church. Church is not a building. Church is people. So the people known as Crossroads Church are building a place. We're developing a property for our community. And so that place has to be rezoned for us to do it. And we need Crossroads Nation to show up. Um, it's 130 Gillespie Street. Uh, if you're on the email list, email went out this week. We'll send another one. That's on the 17th. And... Um, for everybody that's a teammate, uh, December 4th was kind of a big, uh, just final affirmation of moving forward for those of us that are teammates. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate it. Or Faith, excuse me. You look like your dad, but you're not your dad. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Am I crashing and burning as we speak? <laughs> so does anybody have a child who gets heavy when you carry them. <laughs> oh my gosh. Right? So, we, for many of you know, we have four kids, me and the amazing Amanda, and she's been with them all weekend. Bless her heart. You know, oh gosh. Anyways, so the, the second to youngest, Lexi, she's four, three, getting ready to be four. And um, you have so many, you just, you know, there they are, right? <laughs> and so, she's getting ready to be four. She's three years old. And sometimes she falls asleep in the car. And when we get to where we're going, I would open up the van and she sits right there. And I say, come on, Lexi, it's time to get up, honey. And first thing she'll say is, Dad, you hold me? I'm thinking, uh-huh. Right? I'll hold you. So I pick her up. We start walking. And it never fails. After a while, I mean, I'm like, well, let me go to this shoulder. And then I'm like, let me get her up here. And all of a sudden, my arms are hurting. My back is hurting. Everything's just hurting. And I'm thinking, man, this kid is killing me. Right? This kid is killing me. And I'm thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm a guy. I'm a tough guy. I should be able to carry this girl as far as I, I need to carry her. I shouldn't need to have any help whatsoever. I should be able to do it myself. So I just kind of struggle through it until I finally say, buddy, I can't carry you anymore. Just put it down. This morning, as we continue our sermon series looking at hope today, I hope that that picture will give us some insight into undeserving hope. That's where we're headed. 
I want to pray as we normally do this morning, but today something a little different. Uh, as many of you know, a lot of our youth have been in a conference all weekend long with a number of workers, and they're getting ready to end that time here. They're, they should be in the middle of worship right now. A bunch of our parents are going out there to surprise them and cook out for them when they get out of worship. And I'd just like us to take a moment just to pray for all of our youth and for their parents today for the work that God has done in their life. So often, maybe it's been true in your life as it was in mine, but sometimes when we maybe leave out of the normal space of church and head to some place like a retreat or a conference, sometimes those moments that are out of the ordinary, not ordinary time, but those Kairos moments are often times where God does His best work. And we just trust that that's happening in the lives of our youth today. So let's just pray for them. Lord, as we are here today journeying, um, many of our youth are away from us. And God, we would just ask that and trust that you've poured into them all weekend. May you give them the courage, God, and that they just wouldn't be hot right now and then cold tomorrow. But may you give them the courage and the empowerment that they would be on fire for you that they'd be a light for you, that there'd be transformation that would happen in their schools and their families and their friends through them, God. We would ask for you to protect them, Lord, um, from the enemy and just give them the courage to be a light for you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. 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 Welcome to Crossroads. For uh, those of you that don't know me, I'm Chad, uh, the lead pastor here at Crossroads. If you're a guest, we are excited that you're with us. We come together one day a week for public worship. It just seems to us that Sunday works best for us. 10.30 seems to be a good time. So that's when we come together. That's when we choose to do that. Um, and, and we live out our faith all during the week. And then we come together just to celebrate what God has done for us. To maybe hear the invitation that God has for us today, but also the challenge that God gives us to put that invitation to action in the week to come. And so if it kind of resonates with you this morning, if you'd like to know some more about Crossroads, on your way out there's a guest registration table. You probably saw it when you came in. Just type in your information and we'll follow up with you and get some of, of that information to you. Alright? You're going to journey with us. Last week was overflowing hope. And we saw last week that, that when we take the lid off of our lives, but that has to happen. For God to pour into our life, we got to take our lid off. And when we take the lid off of our life, through Jesus Christ, God pours His joy and His peace into our life. And He fills us up to the place that we overflow. And that we're this picture of overflowing hope that we splash over everything and every person that we come into contact with. And the invitation last week was for us to open up our lids, for God to pour His overflowing hope into our lives that we would actually splash over everything and every person we touch. We were challenged to go out into the week to splash over folks. To do some splashing this week. Right? I love being in the pool, especially even with my little kids. Yes, Lexi. She looks at me just pow. You know, do you splash anybody this week? They experience joy and peace of the hope of God through you to rise up to that challenge. Today we're going to look at undeserving hope. We're going to go to the book of Job. If you have your uh, Bibles um, with you this morning, you just open them up to the middle to Psalms. And then if you go uh, one book back to the left, that's Job. Now, Job is a book that's about suffering. And specifically, it's undeserved suffering. Job is experiencing some undeserved suffering in his life. He's not happy about it. He asks some very provocative questions of God. He protests against God for the suffering that he experiences. Job has some friends that come onto the scene. And Job's friends, they want to explain to Job why he's suffering. They want to explain to him what he's done to deserve it. They want to explain to him what he can do to get out of it. They seem to make matters worse than better. And so we're going to see a scripture today where Job is responding to one of his friends. Alright? And this is kind of where Job is at today. Verse 10, we're going to start with in chapter 17. 
Maybe you all would like to start over to try it again, the bunch of you. So far, I haven't come across one scrap of wisdom in anything you've said. My life is about over. All my plans are smashed. All my hopes are snuffed out. My hope that night would turn into day. My hope that dawn was about to break. If all I had to look forward to is a home in the graveyard. If my only hope for comfort is a well-built coffin. If a family reunion means going six feet under and the only family that shows up is worms. Do you call that hope? Who on earth could find any hope in that? No. If Hope and I are to be buried together, I suppose you'd all come to the double funeral. <laughs> Job. Man, I love that guy. So Job is suffering. And to him it's undeserved suffering. Job is at the end of his rope. Right? Job's looking at his life. And as he looks at his life, he sees that he can basically give up hope. That there's no hope for him. And so Job, he wants some answers. Job is protesting what's happening to his life. And then his friends come into the picture and his friends make things even worse. His friends come into the picture and what do they do? They offer an explanation as to why he's suffering. They want to tell Job what he's done to deserve the suffering that he's in. They offer an explanation as to how Job can get out of his suffering. You know, when I'm carrying Lexi around, and she's getting heavy. The last thing I want is one of you to look at me and say, you know, Chad, if you do a, little, a few setups during the day, she wouldn't be too, too heavy. You know, and as she's getting heavy on my arms, the last thing I want is a friend to come into my life and say, you know, Chad, if you just stop eating so much, if your belly wasn't so big, you'd probably be able to carry her a little bit more. Right? The last thing I want is for someone to come into my life and give me explanations as to why I'm not able, why I'm struggling in carrying my little girl. Job reaches out for hope from his friends. And what does he get? He gets explanations from them as to why his life is in the shape that it's in. And ultimately, those explanations, they just lead to more hopelessness. Where Job finally says in our Scripture, maybe just hope and I will be buried together. So what can we learn from this Scripture this morning? What is God's invitation for us this morning? What is God's challenge in our life today? In life, we experience suffering. We experience undeserved suffering, just like Job, that happens within our life. And there's not a formula for us to avoid that suffering happening in our life. Many of you will remember a few weeks ago when we started the series, we talked about suffering. And that we will experience pain and suffering and despair in our life. We will experience that because we're human. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. There's no magic formula, no X, Y, and Z of how we can live to avoid suffering and undeserved suffering within our life. And so when life happens, our top's about to blow. I mean, have you ever watched a pressure cooker cook? Yeah, and some of those old pressure cookers. You have to watch them. I didn't realize that. You have to watch them. And if you don't pay attention to them, they can just blow up right there. Sometimes life feels like that, doesn't it? You know, maybe this morning you're here and you say, you know, my life feels like it's about to blow. I just feel the weight of life pressing in on me. I feel the pressure that is upon me. Often when life happens, when the top's about to blow, family and friends come into the picture. <clears throat> and so often they look like Job's friends. So often when life's about to blow in our lives, our family and friends, they come into the picture and they want to give us explanations as to why things are happening. So often our family and friends are in a place where their life's about to blow, the pressure upon them, and we come into their life and we act just like Job's friends. We want to give them explanations as to why they are where they are. Explanations of how they can get out of the situation that they're in. And so what happens is we live lives. Our friends live lives where we don't want to let people in. We keep our problems to ourselves. And often we keep our problems to ourselves in the name of, I don't want to inconvenience anyone. 
I don't want anybody else to have to know all the problems that I'm going through in my life. But I think at the core of that, we just don't want some friends to come in and explain to us why it's happening. We don't want folks to tell us, well, this is what you need to do to get out of it. And so we keep things to ourselves. Uh, we don't want others to imply that in some way we might deserve what's happened to us in our life. So often we just don't want to visit from Job's friends. So often our family and friends, they keep things to themselves. Hey, things are going great. Things are okay because they don't want to visit from us. They don't want to visit from Job's friends in their lives either. And so we end up giving this perception that, hey, things are okay. How you doing, man? Great. Things are, yeah, things are going good. And then underneath all of that, there's some deep brokenness, some despair some undeserved suffering that we might be experiencing in our lives. But you see, Scripture tells a different story. One of the, the storylines of Scripture is the story of hope. It's the story of redemption. It's the story of transformation. It's the story of hopelessness being transformed into hope. That's one of the, the storylines of Scripture that we have. And specifically, it's hope that happens in community. It's a storyline where we experience hope through a relationship with other people. That as I travel with other people, somehow that relationship can transform my hopelessness to being hopeful. When we share our lives with each other, that's a key for our hopelessness to be transformed. And this is modeled for us through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about it. What does Jesus do? Does He come and give us an explanation to the suffering of our life? <clears throat> Does He come and tell us, no, this is why you're suffering. Does He come and tell us, this is what you've done to deserve this suffering. This is what you need to do to get out of the suffering. Does Jesus come to explain it? No. Does Jesus transform our suffering by telling us what we've done to deserve the situation that we're in? Does Jesus transform our hopelessness by telling us what we need to do to get out of it. No, it's not what He does at all. What Jesus does is He comes and He enters into our suffering. He doesn't give us an explanation, but He enters into it. He puts it on His back and He carries it all the way to Calvary's cross. He takes our suffering. He enters into it. He says, hey, let me get that kid for you. Let me get that suffering for you. Let me go to the cross and there... Let me kill that undeserved suffering once and for all. And then you would have God's undeserved mercy and grace. That undeserved hope would be upon your life. That you would know that God's love would have the last say in your life. Jesus doesn't come to explain our suffering. He comes to enter into it. That our undeserved suffering might be transformed into undeserved hope, love, peace, grace within our lives. What people need in their life when it comes to their suffering and their hopelessness. They don't need an explanation. They need someone to enter into it. What you need in your life when it comes to your suffering, when it comes to your hopelessness, is not someone to explain to you why it's there, but for someone to enter into it. What I need in my life is not for someone to explain to me about the undeserved suffering and hopelessness that I have. But what I need is some friends to enter into that suffering with me. When we enter into someone's suffering, it opens up the floodgates for hope to come pouring into our lives. It's the reminder that we are not alone in our lives. It's the reminder that the joy and the hope and the promise of God through Jesus Christ is that regardless of the pain we may be experiencing in our lives, that God's love will have the last say. It will not be the hopelessness, the suffering of our life, but it will be the hope that has come to us in Jesus Christ. The promise is that others who travel with us, when they enter into our suffering, that they help us carry the load. So often when I'm carrying Lexi, 
and it looks like, you know, it's just like the 30 set, the you know, the five minutes on one arm and five on the other has turned to like 30 seconds here, 30 seconds here. You know, the amazing Amanda should just look at me and say, just give her to me. Just give her here. I'm like, no, God, just give her to me. Just let me take her. <coughs> you know, it's a perfect picture of what we're called to do with each other as we journey. When someone that we love is close to us, family, is experiencing suffering and pain in their life, they don't need an explanation. They don't need to hear why. They don't need to hear how they need to get out of it. They don't need us to fix it. They just need us to come alongside each other, to carry the load, to walk with them, just be present, just to walk with them, to know that they are not alone. This morning we come together and we're going to eat the meal of hope today. Now this meal that we're going to have, it, it's not for perfect people. This meal is not for people that don't experience suffering. This meal is not for people that don't experience any hopelessness in their life. But this meal is for those that know that their hopelessness, their despair, their suffering will not have the last say. This meal is for people who know that as they travel with other folks, as they travel and do life with each other, that those folks will enter into their hopelessness and through that they don't have to carry the load themselves. This meal this morning is for those that know through friendship that's grounded in Jesus Christ that their hopelessness will be transformed into hope. This meal is for those that know that through Jesus Christ God has entered into our suffering. And not only has He entered into it, but He has defeated it. That God's love, His undeserved hope, would have the last say in our life. This meal this morning, it is a meal of hope for the people of hope. Grounded in the promise of hope, surrounded by the God of hope. That those who eat and feast at this meal, those who celebrate this party this morning, that we might be the hope of the world, not by giving explanations of suffering, or giving explanations how to get out of it, but by entering into the suffering of the world the same way that Jesus entered into our suffering in our lives and transformed it. You know, this morning as we get ready to eat at the Lord's table, we always take a moment, it's kind of like washing our hands, a moment where we're able to turn from ourselves, to turn from sin, Sin is just a fancy way to say separation from God. Whatever separates you from God, that is sin. Right? We all got it in our life. Whether we're a follower of Jesus today or we've been one. And we want to take a moment before we come to the table just to, to clean our lives. To say, Lord, I want to turn away from my sin and turn to You. So whatever is in between you and God right now this morning, we're going to take a moment here in just a second. To just take some time to pray. All right? You and God just pray, Lord, this is what's getting in between me and you. Maybe for some of us it is a piece of hopelessness. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a lifestyle. I don't know what that is for you, but you know. God knows. It's a moment for you to say, God, whether it's your first time doing it, it just looks like this. God, I want to turn away from what has separated me from you. Just name it. And I want to turn to you. I believe, Lord, that through Jesus Christ, you can transform my hopelessness into hope. And this morning, I just turn away from that and turn to you. So let's just take a moment. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Just acknowledge to Him Whatever's getting in the way. Whatever's holding you back. Oh, God's people said. Amen. Yeah, I think probably one of the 
the greatest statements we can ever hear someone say to us in our lives is, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're forgiven. And so this morning we sit here as forgiven people. And so I want you to just take just a second, maybe turn to a few people around you, just look them in the eye, and just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're forgiven today. In the name of Jesus Christ, you're forgiven. Robert, can you tell me so I can hear you? Now, uh, I don't know however you kind of celebrate or get excited about things, whether you want to clap or, you know, say woof, woof, or silently, you know, just thank you, Lord. But, but let's just take a moment. Let's just... Let's just bless Him for His forgiveness today. Let's just bless Him. God, we just thank You. We just thank Him. We thank You. That's right. So, whenever we have the Lord's Supper here at Crossroads, we, we tell the story. We tell the story because Jesus told us to tell the story. And the reality is, is everyone's invited to the table. I don't know if you've ever been to a meal or Thanksgiving and there wasn't a seat for you. Well, that's not the case this morning. There's a seat for you at the table. You're all invited to this table. Those that seek Jesus as their Lord and Savior who have turned away from their sin and turned to Him, you're invited to eat this meal. See, it's through Jesus, through His life and His death and His resurrection, He's given birth to the church. I mean, we only gather today because the tomb is empty. It would not be possible for us to gather if it was not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is through His resurrection that He's made us one with Christ, one with Himself, one with each other, one in ministry to the world. And so today we remember those mighty acts. The Scriptures tell us that the night before He was crucified, He had a meal with some of his best friends. He got them together. They were going to hang out, watch Georgia destroy Auburn, and they were going to eat together. And during the meal, he had some bread. And he thanked God for the bread. And he broke the bread, and he gave it to all of his friends. And he said, hey look, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this meal, would you just remember that? And would you tell that story? When the supper was over, he took the cup, Scripture tells us, and he thanked God for it. And he said to all his friends that were there, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of salvation. My blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from this cup, would you just remember that? Would you just tell that story? And so today we remember the story. We tell the story that's been going on for thousands of years. We join, we step into that sacred space in 2011. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, think about that. I mean, folks from, you know, gosh, 40, 50, 80, they've been telling the story. We get to have the same deal and tell the story today. Step into that place. One of the things we do is we affirm the mystery of faith. And you can say this with me. You know that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let's just affirm the mystery of our faith. You can say that with me. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Okay, let's pray over the food. God, we uh, come to you this morning and we would ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us to be poured out upon these gifts of bread and wine. God, may You make them be the body and blood of Christ that we might be the body of Christ for the world redeemed by Your blood. Father, we would ask that You would make us one with You, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world until You come in final and complete victory. And when You do there, God, we will feast at your heavenly banquet. 
All honor and glory is yours forever and ever. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for us. Hallelujah. And this is the blood of Christ shed for us. Amen. When I ask those that are helping me with the uh, Lord's Supper to come up at this time, and you can just stand right here. Um, a couple of directions. One of our cups broke, so we have to change some things up this morning. Um, there will be a station right behind this last row in the middle. That's for you back folks. All right? Do you all sit in the same place every week? You all like, this is my seat? <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm kidding. Not really, that's fine. All right, so right behind there, there will be a station, okay? And there will be two people with bread on either side. There will be a cup in the middle. They're going to tear off a piece of bread, and they're going to tell you the body of Christ. If you just make a cross in your hand, it's just the idea you have to do nothing. All right? You have to do nothing to receive Jesus except open your life to Him. Make a cross with your hand. They'll tell you the body of Christ broken for you. They'll put it in your hand. Um, you'll then be able to dip that bread into the cup. They'll tell you this is the blood of Christ that shed for you, right? That would be the moment if you want to give another whoop, whoop, 